Well, it's good to be with you today. Welcome to those of you worshiping with us by Facebook and 99.1 and the stream and YouTube and here with us this morning, <laughs> lest we forget. Yeah, it's good to be with you. I don't have many announcements, but I do want to make this one announcement. I'm pretty excited of, about them and I'm proud of them as well. Michaela and Ryan Wellman, so this is uh, Ryan Wellman, Jeff and Jill's oldest son, had a little boy. And his name is Abel Ryan, and uh, he was born here just about two weeks ago on the 13th. And we have a flower on the altar this morning, just celebrating the birth of that baby boy. So, yeah, pretty excited. It's a special time for them. Do we have any other announcements as we get started here this morning? Yeah. There'll be the individual uh, cups and, and wafers are being provided in the package. They'll probably be wrapped up in a, in a Ziploc bag for you to be able to use. But we're going to have the opportunity to give God thanks and, and uh, remember the price that Jesus paid for. So next Sunday, uh, we're going to be able to communion in, in a way that I think we'll keep everyone safe. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day that we are up and about this morning and we thank you for life and God it is good to worship you it is good to lift up your name and that's what we are here to do this morning God we are reminded that you are just so far beyond and above and outside of things that we can even comprehend yet God you step down to spend time with us and we are asking that you meet here with us this morning that you move through this building, but even more importantly, through our hearts, God, we invite you in as we spend these moments with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand with us if you're able. We ready? Okay, one, two, three. You are the Lord. The famous one, famous one, great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare that you're glorious. Great is your fame beyond the earth. For all that you've done and for all you've done. And yet to do with every breath, I'm praising you. Desire of nations and every heart, you will honor God. You will honor God. You are the Lord. And you the Lord, the famous one, great is your name in all the earth, the heavens declare that you're glorious, great is your fame beyond the earth. star is shining through and every eye is watching you revealed by nature and miracles you are beautiful you are beautiful you are the Lord, the famous one. Great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare that you're glorious. Great is 
your fame be on the earth. Great is your fame. Great is your fame be on the earth. Amen. In just a second, we're going to switch gears up here. I think we've got to get a capo on, and Jared's going to switch instruments. And, and um, those of you with kids in KFC age, I'm going to be giving a call to you this week, Tuesday sometime. be trying to uh, spend some time on the phone with you this morning uh, to see about getting, or not this morning, Tuesday morning, about getting you set up uh, for our fall. Um, usually it's our after-school program, but we're going to be doing it a little bit differently this this year, at least for the start of the year. So um, be expecting a call from me sometime this week and starting Tuesday. So, all right.
stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. Uh, in order to remember that God is still in charge. And, uh, and I was just thinking about that. You, you, uh, do, do you remember the course, and we, we've sung it a couple times with children, even at KFC, but I, I know that many of you know it. Remember just the course, he's got the whole world in his hand, right? He's got the whole world in his hand. And, uh, and here's what I want to do. I'm gonna, we're going to try to sing a few verses, if we can remember any of the verses. I know you'd remember them all. But we're going to just sing those a little bit. And what I'd like to do is have this run over and over in your mind for a while. So that when you hear the crazy things on the news, you start singing, he's got the whole world in his hands, all right? Uh, and when you see something going on that's, that's goofy at school, he's got the whole world in his hands. And, and for those of you kids in your school, and you want to take that mask off, but you know you can't, he's got the whole world in your hands. And uh, help us with that, will you Yeah, so I'm thinking the verses we could sing is he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole wide world in his hands. Then we can sing, he's got the mommy and the daddy in his hands. Good. Then how about the brother and the sister? I'll take it. And we'll end with uh, the little bitty baby. Oh, you there yeah, you go. Will that work for us? That works. See if we can remember this. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the mommy and the daddy in his hands. He's got the mommy and the daddy in his hands. He's got the mommy and the daddy in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Brother and sister. He's got the brother and the sister in his hands. He's got the brother and the sister in his hands. He's got the brother and the sister in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Amen. I want, want Jerome to stand here just a little bit longer uh, because I, I, want, uh, I want you kids to, to picture whether you're tuning in on by, by no matter how you're listening or watching us right at the moment or, or right here, you know, some people still are here. And uh, no matter how you're doing that, uh, I want you to just picture Jerome as a little bitty baby. Can, can you do that? I was a cute one too. We don't know what happened since uh, then, but I was I'll cute bet. then. <laughs> and of course... I think we're tempted to say Jerome peaked at an early age is really what that would be, right? But, uh, but, he, but he's got Jerome in his hands, he's got me in his hands, he's got you in his hands, the one beside you, he's got that. So instead of us walking around defeated, instead of us uh, feeling us so discouraged because the craziness is all around us, will you just remember he's got the whole world in his hand? Could we just do the chorus part, just, just that he got just one verse one more time? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Let's pray. 
Lord, put a song in our heart this week. Put a smile on our faces. Give us the opportunity to be salt and light to the people that we come in contact with. Help the first conversation we have not to be how lousy everything is, but what we have in you. Encourage each of my young friends this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Jerome. Again, we're just going to uh, we're going to give God thanks for the offering here at this point. Uh, you're, you're continuing to find the offering plate no matter where it is in the building. Thank you. Um, but we also want to be able to to uh, to lay these gifts uh, on the on the table uh, before God in His presence and give Him thanks. Pray with me. Holy and righteous God, giver of every good gift, sustainer, redeemer, creator, to you we give thanks. To you we acknowledge that every good thing we have is given to us by you. There are counterfeits out there and there are others who take the credit for things that they have done, but you are the one who ultimately provides. We give you thanks and we ask that you receive these gifts. Might your anointing be upon them. And each one who has obediently uh, shared back with you what, what you have laid on his or her heart. Use these gifts for your kingdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. story to share with you um, um, this morning and so my youngest starts school this week that's happening already and um, just am reminded of when Amelia started school and um, there was another dad there and we're trying not to cry you know our little girls are going to school and, and I bend down and I give Amelia a hug and, and I said Amelia I'm, I'm proud of you and she says I'm proud of you too dad <laughs> and so I Oh, I just share that because it's a it's a it's a tender time when we're sending our kids to school, and that's happening this week. And like I said, my youngest one's going, and so we need to be praying for our children, praying for our teachers, and uh, doing right by our our children. So um, it's it's kind of cool. I'm still at a stage where I'm a hero to my kids, but that um, doesn't always stay that way. But then uh, when we get to be later in life, my dad's my hero again. So. That's cool how that works, but uh, yeah. How can we be praying for you? Yeah. Uh, just prayers for those that have been impacted by the hurricane or displaced and for our nation. Mm-hmm. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to Philadelphia later on today. She'll have doctor appointments tomorrow and surgery on Tuesday. Hopefully we come back home with less than what she has on her. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Good to be with you, Rosemary. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Did you see the first name you said? Faith. Faith. Okay. All right. Health issues. Yeah, Leah. Uh, please Mm -hmm. cancer and his treatments and also praise is we've got the water fountain in so if you came in the front door and didn't see it make sure you yep. it's out here along the side it's beautiful yeah and that when I first walked by I wanted to sit down and just lean up against the church she's talking about the water fountain out here and that bubbling water running water noise it's just it's just yeah um, helps me understand a little bit more about the springs of living water that just brings respite yeah and Oh, great. He was one of the donors. Yeah. And uh, he had his last visit this past week and uh, texted his mom afterwards and said he had his last visit. And the only thing he said was, I'm allowed to serve. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed to serve. Okay. That's pretty well the Yeah, I would say so. Thanks, Ann. Yeah. I'm going to come back. Police. Oh, the policeman. Yeah, law enforcement. Yep. Absolutely. 
Yeah, Mike. You started it with that song. I mean, really good food. <clears throat> we were talking yesterday about how happy we are to live in a small town like this during all this unrest. I mean, our hearts break for people have to face all the danger and the destruction, mm -hmm. but we're really blessed in this community with our family and being safe and things like that. And it reminds me when I was on the road and I'm going to steel mill in a big city, and the guy would see in Pleasantville, Pennsylvania, on the side of my truck, and they would say, boy, that sounds like a nice place to live. The next best thing to Mayberry, that's right. <laughs> I planted like five zucchini plants this year, so I get that joke. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Let's pray. God, it is good to, to just let loose and have a little bit of fun when we come together. And we're reminded of just how blessed we are with um, this community um, and the surrounding communities that we are a part of and the people um, that we know. God, I just ask you that you would continue to bless our community and give us the ability to bring goodness, to continue to bring goodness to it and others around. God, we pray for those that are traveling today um, and this week. We pray for safety. God, we pray for healing for those that are uh, dealing with health issues, cancer and, and diabetes and, and just so many different um, things we deal with um, at this, in this moment in history, God, um, but we are so blessed to have the medical care that we have available, so we thank you as well. God, we pray for our law enforcement and first responders and leaders of this nation, and God, um, we know that our, um, the service people of this country are valuable to us, God, and we are asking that you would bless them and protect them. And God, we also know that um, it's just in the political environment that we are in right now, God, we just stop and recognize that our Savior is not going to come through a political party or affiliation, God, but we find saving and purpose in you. Continue to teach us how to be like you. God, for any unspoken prayer requests or other requests that were shared this morning, God, we lay them at your feet and trust, God, knowing that you are the God who provides, the God who heals, and God, you are the I am, the God who hears our prayers, and we thank you and we love you, and it is through your son Jesus that we come. Amen. I want to read today from the book of Acts, chapter 17, just beginning verse 26. From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And some of your own poets have said, or as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now we're going to turn back to Romans. And you get extra credit if you remember that I read this passage last week. And I'm just saying that right now so you can all try to get extra credit. From Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, we want to start off with a question today. Is Jesus real to me? It's a good question. Let's put it up on the chalkboard, okay? Is Jesus real to me? Now, just before we go any further, let me just say this. You might know about Jesus, but do you know him? You understand the difference, right? A lot of people know something about Jesus, but do you know him? Or is he a story that you have read about and heard about? Or is he someone that you've experienced? Some shape or form. Uh, all these questions, you know, God is spirit. But Jesus came in flesh uh, in order for us to be able to, to, to identify uh, with, with, uh, with God and what he, price he's paid for you and me. So the question is, is he a real person to you? And is he real to you personally? Well, John Wesley used to ask a set of questions to those that he was discipling in those early days of Methodists. And um, he uh, put, together, uh, put together some 21 questions, and we'll talk about them a little bit later, as to how to go about it. Now, anytime I hear 21 questions, I do want that image if I could. Uh, every time I think of 21 questions, I, 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 I've watched it on TV where, where they'll take a person, they'll take a person I, I see it on the sports talk shows, where they just ask a bunch of questions that help, it helps people get to know who they are. Uh, and uh, I had to, had to call up, uh, and, and at Jerome's, uh, at Jerome's advice, I called up uh, Isaac Bowen this, this week and say, Isaac, now every time the old pastor talks about things, is there a chance that maybe a new generation is using this in a different way that I should know about? And uh, so Isaac was my one, one college-age friend who was glad to fill us in. And he said, well, Pastor Larry says some people use it and ask inappropriate questions, and there's that going on. But he said you can use it either way. So Isaac gave me permission to be able to talk about 21 questions and boldly speak. That was good advice, Jerome. Thank you. Uh, so. And sometimes when you read about Wesley, you may see that in 21 questions, 22 questions, a great many, uh, particularly United Methodist churches, uh, will talk about this. But also, don't forget, United Methodism is only one of the denominations that see themselves in the line of the Western Revival and Wesleyan movement from uh, the 1700s in England. Uh, there are a number of them. Uh, our Nazarenes, uh, you know, come to my mind real quick. The Free Methodists, the Wesleyan Methodists, these are all ones that are right here in town. So a number of us look back to John Wesley for, for a lot of things that we began with. We don't worship him. In fact, we can show you things in times in which he blew it. But he is a unique character. And, uh, and in the, the, the Wesleyan, re or the revival that took place in the 1700s in England, uh, is due large part to the movement called Methodism. And uh, so what John was doing was that he was teaching the people that he was working with to ask uh, certain questions, some every day, uh, some space it out. Uh, and uh, if you can identify with this, uh, I, I, let me just back, or let me move on ahead here and say that I, I've even seen these 21 questions being asked, not, not spiritually, but in speed dating. Where, where a couple may be able to ask each other those questions and, and uh, just in order to get to know them, uh, one another in some shape or form. But the question that I have here is there, are there questions that we can be asking of each other or we can ask ourselves, which is really what Wesley was encouraging him to do. He'd ask the question, but he wanted them to ask of themselves. Are there questions that we can, uh, can deal with that, that help us to be able to grow in our relationship with God? To know God more, to know God better, however you want to put it. So Wesley was part of something that they called the Holy Club of Oxford. When he um, was 26 years old, he had come back to, uh, to Oxford, to Lincoln College. There were some 30, some colleges in that university, by the way. But he came back to Lincoln College, uh, which was theology, uh, was where he was, or what he was attending. And he was, had been ordained while he was there in the Anglican Church. He'd gone home and, and helped out his father in their home parish for a little while. But now he's come back as a, as a, as a teaching fellow uh, there at, at, at Oxford. And at that time, his brother Charles, who was five years younger, had, had already started there. And Charles was starting to meet with uh, uh, two, other, two other gentlemen, 
uh, one of them being George Whitfield, which you'll read a lot about if you read about uh, uh, the, the revivals of the 1700s, both in England and in America. Uh, George Whitfield was one of them, and, uh, and a gentleman by the name of Morgan was the other one that had met with them. And Charles came to John and said, you know, five years older, uh, he was the most disciplined man that, that Charles knew. He said, would you, would you help us? as we are trying to grow in our relationship. They were all about ready to be ordained and, and to go into the Anglican priesthood. Would you help us? And so Wesley began to do it. He met with them on a regular basis. They started out meeting on Sunday evenings. Uh, uh, Becky and Bruce, that has a good ring to it, doesn't it? They started out meeting on Sunday evenings, but this will scare you. Then they decided to start meeting two times a week. And then they started meeting every night. So I just, you know, if you see cars showing up at the farm out there, you, you'll know that it's getting out of hand, all right? Just every Sunday night they would meet with them. And, uh, and, and it would grow at that point in time. But he taught them to keep examining their own lives. Now, introspection can be not, not, to be, not to be depressed by introspection, but to ask the kind of leading questions. Am I measuring up? Am I, is there change taking place in my life? Uh, and, and so what I want to remind you of these particular questions are not, they're not really salvation questions. These questions assume that you either have given your life to Jesus or you are exploring uh, giving your life to Jesus. Does that make sense to you? So this is how you might be able to determine whether you're growing. And I have an image here of, uh, of Wesley standing in, that, standing in that place where so many would meet. The Holy Club started out with just the four of them. It went up to six and seven at times and then would come back down because you can imagine uh, this was such a disciplined approach as to how they would uh, uh, give, give attention to their lives. I've, I've read before the kind of schedule that these guys kept, and, uh, and it's just astounding to me. I, I know that even when uh, Charles and John were on their way over to Georgia in the Americas when they did their first missionary journey, uh, and they were both in there, they were about 30 years old at that time, and when they, and, and when they came across, they, they, uh, they started their morning out at five o'clock with prayer, Six o'clock, they would study uh, Latin, Greek, uh, Hebrew. Uh, I mean, you know, just a couple of little subjects you're working on. Uh, and then they, would, then they would move on to, to prayer and, and the teaching of scripture. At noon, they would all get together for worship. And then in the afternoon, they were in conversations, encouraging the other people that were on the, on the ship. Uh, and, and in the evening, then they would have a fellowship together at the meal. And in the evening, they would give attention to prayers and worship and uh, try to be in bed by nine. Well, I know what I'd have been like. I'd have been napping during that afternoon with that kind of schedule. Uh, that, would have been, that would have been really tough to keep. But you can see why it was almost in a bit of a derision that, that they began to label them as Methodists. Or there was a method in their, in their discipleship, so to speak, or how they, they followed Christ. The other thing that was leveled at them in those days is they were called enthusiasts. That doesn't sound like such a negative thing to you and me today, but uh, 300 years ago, which is almost what we're talking about now, 300 years ago, if you were an enthusiast, that meant that you were a person, here are the things it meant, meant that you were emotional about your faith, um, not rational. It meant that uh, uh, enthusiasts were people who believed that God spoke to them personally. Thank you, if I'm ever called that, by the way. Enthusiasts were people who believed God spoke to them per, uh, personally. Enthusiasts were people who were blamed, kind of like if, if you have a negative view of, of, of uh, anyone who came out of the charismatic movement in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or even today, if you have a negative opinion about that, that's what enthusiasm meant to them. And to the Anglican established church, it was like the worst thing that could possibly happen uh, because these people actually believed that God was still speaking to them and that God helped them interpret things uh, and, and showed them things that maybe he wasn't showing the Anglican priests. You get what I'm saying? So, so enthusiasts was really a derision. And uh, so, so they, were, they had to be lonely sometimes. But when I read about John and Charles both, in their, when they were like high school age, and I just say that because they, they'd go to boarding school when they were about 13 years old. Uh, and, and they would be uh, you know, in the London area. Unfortunately, they had an older brother who was 10, 15 years older that, that was keeping track of them. But they were considered to be some of the most lighthearted and fun-loving uh, young boys at that place. 
Uh, and neither of them very serious at first about their faith. Which, how unusual is that for a young man, right? They're not very serious about their faith. But bit by bit, they began to be more serious. They, they still struggled with that knowing God heartfelt, but they searched for him in ways in which most people do not search for him. Uh, and do you know that if you keep searching for God and his presence, you will find him? He may, God may reveal himself to you in different ways, but he will find you. And of course, that's exactly what they did. So that brings me back to the question, one of the questions that Wesley asked, is Jesus real to me? Now, when you leave today, I'm going to ask you to pick up in the back. Uh, Angel has him in the back there. In fact, if you, if you turn around, she's got it up in the air. But uh, there's, there's one of these for each family, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and if you need more than one, by all means, I, can, I know how to print up more. But uh, they, what they are are 21 questions over the next count starting today. For about 21 days, I've got a, I'm going to try to have a question for you that you can ask of yourself. Uh, I'm not going to check up on you, and I don't want you to know how I'm doing it with my, with my Lord as well. But uh, 21 questions, 21 days to a more authentic faith. And the one for today is, is Jesus real to me? And you'll get an opportunity to read John 3, 3 to 17. And, uh, and I'll deal with some other passages today that help me move along with that. But I hope that you'll pick one of those up. Uh, you know, we're not supposed to... You know, we're, the only reason we're not handing them out to you is we're really not supposed to be passing things around during this COVID. So, so we've got it back there. And if you would just pick one up as you go, I think you'll find it. It's two pages front and back. So here's what the questions are for this week. Is Jesus real to me? And that's for uh, the 20th or, or for, the, for the 30th of August. On Monday, here's the question. Am I enjoying prayer? Uh, Tuesday. Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? Wednesday, did the Bible live in me today? Thursday, did I disobey God in anything? Friday, do I pray about money, about the money I spend? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cancel that one, but uh, okay. Do I give time for the Bible to speak to me every day as on Saturday? And if you're willing to keep these, if you may read them all at once, that's possible. Or you may want to take them one day at a time. But I just want to offer something. Because what we're trying to do here, I know, I know so many of you have given your life to Jesus. But here's the thing. Even if you've given your life to Jesus, it's possible that you almost don't know him anymore. Uh, it's a good thing to trust him for your salvation, to invite him to be the Lord of your life. But the danger is that we rely on a little bit of time. Hopefully the Jerome sings the right songs on a Sunday morning. Hope the pastor picks the right scripture or has something that doesn't put us to sleep so that we can, can move on. And the truth of the matter is, those of us who love Jesus, who want to know him and say he's real to us, are going to find other ways in order to, to spend time with him. So that's what this is designed for. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll be providing that for you. And I just wanted you to know that now. question is, what, what is a spiritual life? We live in a day and age in which people talk about spirit, being spiritual. Have, have you run into that? Uh, people who I'm pretty sure don't believe in Christ, um, may not even believe in God, uh, they'll say, I'm not, I'm not religious, meaning I don't have a, a denomination, a, a world religion of any kind. I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. To this day, I really don't know what they mean. But I'm willing to understand that a lot of people ask it. Atheists have written books on their spirituality. Isn't that amazing? So there's something that they recognize that is out there. Um, for, for myself and for you, I suspect, uh, we know that spirituality ends up being in, in our relationship with God. And so my own, what little definition I have here, and I'm going to throw it up on the chalkboard here, is it's knowing God loving God, and serving God. Now, there are better, better dictionary definitions out there for spirituality, but for my purpose and what we're dealing with here this week, uh, what is it that you might be doing in your life that helps you know God? What is it that you're doing that's allowing you to love God and love God more? And finally, uh, the proof in the pudding ends up then, then what are you doing in order to serve God? The Holy Club that I was talking about uh, started out with working on the scripture and Bible study, and they did that. A little later on, one of them felt, uh, felt called that they should be going to the prisons and, and praying with, the, with the, the ones who were condemned to die, particularly. 
And, uh, and so this holy club, and, and people called Methodists did this for, for out th throughout the 1700s, uh, where they'd actually go to Newgate Prison, and they'd go to some of the other places where, where people were on death row, uh, sometimes, sometimes for indebtedness, sometimes for whatever crimes against the, uh, the king, whatever it would be. And, uh, and they would pray with them. They didn't try to get them released. They tried to give them every opportunity to, uh, to see God. And they said that sometimes there would be singing from the prisoners before they went to the gallows. So one of the things they did on a regular basis was visit with those who were in jail, visit with those who were in prison, and, uh, and they offered them Christ. Now there were people who were furious. The people who accused them of being enthusiasm felt that the cruelest thing you could be doing to someone who's going to the gallows is to be, is to be beating them up with spiritual issues. And yet to the, to the Holy Club, it was the most important thing they could do to offer them Christ. And I think you understand that as we look back on history. Uh, so how do you know God? How do you love God? Not only did they do that, but they decided to, uh, they decided, <laughs> these students, they had nothing. You know, we talk about the poor student. When I, when I go to colleges now, I see these, I see kids dr driving cars that I, I could only dream about. Uh, and um, you go to the major universities, the haves and the have-nots are, are very, very clear. But, uh, but these students really had almost nothing. They lived on a small stipend of some kind, uh, literally pennies. And, uh, and they determined to start bringing one penny, uh, one penny a week. And they used it in order to help feed the poor and to give to the poor. So there was this desire to know God, to love God, and to serve God. Now you're ready for me to um, ready for me to go back to the scriptures and begin looking at, at these concepts here. I want to start first with uh, Acts 17, which I read a little bit ago. And I want to just leave that up before you before I talk. Acts 17 is a great uh, chapter for you to read if you decide to read this today. Acts 17 starts out with with uh, Paul and his team going to Thessalonica. I think if you're Greek, you might say Thessalonica, but uh, I'm American with bad English, so it's Thessalonica is what I'm going to work on here. And and at Thessalonica, they start out uh, speaking in the, you know, speaking in the um, uh, uh, synagogues. That's that's the first sign that the mind's going. By the way, there it goes in the synagogues. So they were working at that point, doing that, and and, uh, and then they get to push back from those that are established those that are long and they and uh, and they began to accuse him and then people started accusing him of things they had not heard tell me this doesn't sound like a 21st century problem where people say they, they just running around saying there's another king beside uh, you know be, besides Caesar and and so then that just escalates and then people are starting to say that without ever having heard Paul out uh, and doesn't that sound like what we read about today right so so there's just horrible stuff that's going on and so Paul then ends up having to go from Thessalonica to Berea. Well, what's the scripture say about Berea? The, the people in Berea were more, uh, were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And they searched the scriptures to see if what Paul was teaching, preaching was so. As opposed to just lambasting him because of what he had said, they, they heard him, they read what he'd done and, and proved for themselves one way or the other. So, so we have the best... Uh, best memories of, of that. And, and it worked out really well in Berea until people from Thessalonica traveled down in order to cause the trouble for the believers that were there. And from there then he has to really escape. And so he goes to Athens. And it's at Athens where he begins to reason with the, the, the Stoics and, 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 uh, and just, you know, the Epicureans just beginning to work with them uh, and, and, and share with them. And they loved ideas. So he was invited to the Areopagus, which might have been a place, but it was usually the, a ruling body, uh, but it was a group of intellectuals, to be honest with you, that gathered together. It might have been in a big, sophisticated building, or it might have been in a field up on the, on the hill. But the Areopagus uh, would met, and they said, what is this that you're teaching that you're talking about? And, and, uh, and they would talk about the, 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 a resurrection of Jesus. And, and so this is a famous conversation in which Paul has with them about uh, seeing the, it's the stone or the, the altar, the the, the uh, God that's given for the unknown God. And he says, uh, you know, he says, uh, I know the, the unknown God. Not only did Paul confess that he knew God, he did his best and he loved them enough to be able to help them to know the unknown God. 
So here's what we, what one of the things he said is in verse, uh, is in this verse, is 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Paul was trying to communicate to the men of Athens that, uh, and there were women as well, because some of the women were the, the earliest believers, uh, trying, to, trying to help them understand that God was everywhere. You know, you might as well have been singing, he's got the whole world in his hands, you know, uh, because that's exactly what he was teaching and preaching. Let me read on in, in Romans 12. Do not confirm to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. To know God, to love God more, so there's nothing wrong with us asking questions, uh, uh, just you and me, or just you and me maybe, or you and God, whatever it works out for you. As we ask our questions of, of each other and of God, you know, am I, um, is Jesus real to me? Can I answer that, that I do know him? Can I answer that, 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 that in knowing him, that I have this strong desire to love him more and love him more? And then also, do I have this strong desire as well to serve him because of the love that I have for him and he has for me? I look at this, uh, uh, so Paul hints at a process that takes place. He doesn't just offer them Christ. He offers them Christ, but then he builds in a, a discipleship plan. That's why, that's why those of you who are part of a small group, part of one of the Sunday school classes, there are two of them that meet right after we're done here, uh, are part of a small group that you're meeting with. Uh, somehow, some way, will you spend time uh, beginning to, to recognize that there's a process. Uh, it's one thing to give our lives to Jesus. It's another thing to live like we've given our lives to Jesus. It's almost like if I could put it in the vernacular of today's political world, make faith great again. Or maybe this way, faith, build back better. Doesn't that sound like a, this day and age? Uh, and if we could take those words and bring them, into the, bring them into our relationship with God, then those words all start to make sense to me. Well, let's go back and take a look at, at uh, what happened in creation. Remember, God created everything out of, out of nothing. He spoke it into being, right? Uh, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all the six days on that, but just a reminder to you, he created. What I wanna point out is that it was at the, end of, uh, at the end of those six days, or on the sixth day, that he created men, male and female, he made them. And he saw that it was good. The scriptures teach us through Genesis 1 that, that, that uh, his creation of, of uh, men and women were the crown of his creation. All right, I just need you to look at each other right now and say, yeah, you're, you're a crown of God's creation. Just tell that person right beside you that. Tell them that. Yeah, we almost forget that sometimes. You know, and if you're a Republican and have to tell that to the Democrat, it still works. If you're a Democrat and have to tell that to the Republican, it still works. Um, when you get to Genesis 2, I, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but, but Genesis 2 uses even different Hebrew words than what Genesis 1 does. So it's probably formed by, uh, by a different author or inspired through a different author, uh, and yet beautiful, and, and, and these put Genesis 1 and 2 together, we learn an awful lot about God's creation. But, but Genesis 2 shows a little bit different view of, of uh, of Adam and Eve in this case, where Adam and Eve aren't named in Genesis 1, but in Genesis 2, they are named. First, uh, Adam is, is created, and then the new and improved version, Eve, is brought into the face of the earth, right? So, so there's this beautiful creation story that takes place in that. But here's the difference. In Genesis 1, we read that, that, that uh, they were made in God's image, which is really very lofty. In Genesis 2, we realize that they were not satisfied with being made in God's image and they wanted to be like God. So not only did they want to be like God is that they yielded to the, to the eating uh, the, the, the fruit from the forbidden tree in the garden. And secondly, uh, then they started to blame one another and blame others for their, own, uh, for their own sin and their own thing. Boy, does that sound like something I identify with. Uh, and, and on it goes. So, so from the very beginning, there's this struggle going on with men and women. Uh, we're made in the image of God but we end up wanting to be like God and to be God and to, and to usurp his role and, and his care. And of course, that's what we know is, is bring sin into the world and that ends up being absolutely destructive. 
How about Psalm 139? Many of you, many, some of you probably have portions that's memorized. But the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If you go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. He's got the whole world in his hands, right? Everywhere we go, we're able to see him and see his presence in that process. Romans 8, 39. I, I'm not sure I ever end most funerals without reciting these words. Nothing, and I'll skip all the things that he talks about there, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God as in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then I'd like to offer a test. I say this all the time. I've got a quiz for you. What can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Nothing, nunga, never, nada, nothing can separate you and me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So I ask myself the question, is God real to me? He is, but I want more of him. So it brings us back to the 21 questions that we talked about in the very beginning. Some of the scholars believe that, and, and by the way, these kind of questions whenever you're meeting with people you know and people you don't know can be really awesome, by the way. Uh, if there's no hidden agenda of just getting to know people. Most, uh, most of the scholars believe that, that John Wesley probably, had, during a time in which he was working with the Holy Club, he was reading writings of St. Ignatius. Uh, you've heard of Ignat St. Ignatius from Loyola. Uh, and uh, he would be the founder of the Jesuit community. And of course, don't forget that uh, the Anglican Church was not far off from the, from the Ref Reformation during those days. Um, yes, uh, you know, yes, more like a, a hundred and some years, but, but still, it was still fresh. And so he would read, uh, and, and we have to acknowledge many times that, that we all come from the, the, from the disciples, okay? From what Jesus had worked with the disciples, we all come from, and uh, so every once in a while, if you get real, real haughty in your denomination, whatever it is, please note that we all have come and owe something to those who have gone before us. But here's what Ignatius had written. He put together some called daily exam and questions. And I'm just going to read them to you here. In other words, and Wesley borrowed these questions, they think, because his questions are very much like this. And, and so every day, Ignatius would encourage people to do this, the Jesuits particularly. What are the blessings in my life? Give thanks for them. What a way for me to deal with my discouragement at the end of the day or beginning of the day or the middle of the day just to start counting my blessings. Mike offered one of them just a little bit ago what it's like for us to be able to live in our community and give God thanks. Where did I meet God today in my work? I like the father who, who decided that, you know, you keep asking the kids at the end of the day, what did you learn today? You know, what did, what did you do today? What, what's going on? You know, and, and, um, and so they basically, he basically started offering them 25 cents if they could remember anything that they learned about God that day. And 25 cents at a time, they began to reflect on what God had done in their lives. What happened in my day? What did I learn? This is the third one. Where did I fall short in God's will today? Fifth, offer tomorrow's plan for tomorrow. Man, I don't know about you, but I go to bed some night, and I may not be able to fall asleep because of what's supposed to take place the next morning. And I have to sometimes just consciously, consciously seek God and say, ah, I, I'm going to offer you my plan. You probably can't do anything to help me, Lord. You know, it's almost that pathetic in my prayer. But, but I begin to offer him that plan. And, uh, and he picks me up again and again. And don't worry about me, I fall asleep every night, okay? May fret as soon as I wake up, but I, but I sleep. Then there are two mores that just get offered by some that, that, loyal, uh, that Ignatius did not do. Where it's just kind of goes out saying, pray for the needs of others. And possibly even pray the Lord's Prayer. What a beautiful witness. And I know people who would just repeat the Lord's Prayer many times. Not, not just by rote, but use it as a guide to their prayer lives. What if we would just examine ourselves 
every day. I'm, I need to confess to you that that's not something I do every day right now. If I could just offer this to you as something that I'm aiming to do, will you believe that? You know, it's just something, uh, like, like you, uh, I'm, I'm doing everything I can in order to grow in my faith, uh, and, and, uh, and I know I've just scratched the surface, but even as a grandpa, I think there are quite a few things that I can be learning right now. In some ways, I'm more able to listen now than I was 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 40 years ago. Make faith great again. Take faith and build back better. Every time you hear those things from now on, will you apply that to faith? Final question, is Jesus real to me? Don't forget to pick up that sheet. I'm going to ask the worship team if they'd come. Don't forget to pick up that, that guide uh, at the back that, that you could be reading up and, and seeing some of the scriptures dealing with this this week. Over the next seven days, um, we're just going to ask God to start showing us how to know him more, how to love him more, and how to serve him. We invite you to stand with us once again, if you are able. Words of worship rise like a river within me. And thoughts to express are so many. Wanna bless you, God. Can't be silent. I think of the mercies you show me. My lips begin overflowing. Great is your love. Such gratitude for all that you do. Jesus, to you at the top of my lungs, I will sing hallelujah. You're the one who saved me, the one who gave me this life I live forevermore, forevermore. At the top of my lungs, I will sing hallelujah. I'm not ashamed. I'll praise your name, let the whole world know I love you, Lord I love you, Lord You are worthy to join in the song of creation That rings out across every nation let my heart be heard I need you so And I don't care who knows From the depths of my soul At the top of my lungs I will sing hallelujah The one who saved me The one who gave me This life I live Forevermore Forevermore At the top of my Lungs, I will sing hallelujah. I'm not ashamed. I'll praise your name. Let the whole world know I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. top of my lungs, huh? As you get ready to go this week, uh, please know that I'm going to be praying for you, and I know that um, you're going to be praying for me. One of the most humbling things I run into from time to time are some of you who say, you know, Pastor, I pray for you every day. You have no idea how many times through the day I'm thinking, Lord, someone's praying for me, and I can tell you, you don't like my behavior today. I can tell that I'm not honoring you right at this moment. And uh, so the mere fact that you're praying for me every day somehow brings the presence of God into me again and again and again. And uh, I just want you to know he is answering those prayers. Okay? Go in peace.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.